Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Rice here to uh, interview uh, my friend and uh, a West Point graduate, fellow West Point graduate, Bob McDonald. Bob, welcome. Hey, Dan. Great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, it's an honor for us to have you here. Um, and I'd like to briefly introduce uh, a little bit about your background to the to the audience. They've seen your biography, so they're familiar a little bit. But, uh, but Bob is a 1975 graduate of West Point. Um, he graduated and went off into the Army. Uh, served in the 82nd Airborne, one of our elite paratrooper units. Um, he finished his commitment to the U.S. Army, and then he started working for Procter & Gamble, the largest consumer products company in the world. And he rose from an entry-level role leaving the military to CEO, chairman and CEO of Procter & Gamble. And uh, as if that wasn't enough, after Bob retired from that role, he was appointed by President Obama to be on the cabinet, the highest level. The cabinet is the senior leadership, uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and Bob was the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Our veterans organization in the United States is enormous. It includes the largest healthcare company uh, organization in the world and, and a whole bunch of support functions. So Bob has an extensive experience in veterans support programs in the U.S., and we're here to talk about many of the things that he learned over his course of his lifetime in leadership and also in veteran support, things that can actually be implemented within Ukraine uh, today. So welcome, Bob. Thank you, Dan. Great to be with you. Well, yeah, if you could explain a little bit about, uh, in particular, your role as the the, 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 the Secretary of Veterans Administration, uh, Veterans Affairs Administration, uh, you were the only the eighth in history, I believe, uh, that's correct. Uh, you know, the United States has a history of um, trying to take care of veterans. Uh, we, it's kind of an uneven history. We don't do it well sometimes. We do it well other times. Um, but really, the beginning of the Department of Veterans Affairs came about with President Lincoln's second inaugural address um, after the Civil War, when he said, we have to care for those who have borne the battle, their widows and their orphans. Now, today we have many women in the military, so we, we say we have to care for those who are born in the battle and their families. And, uh, and we've done um, a relatively good job of that over time. It was really after World War II where President Truman asked uh, General Bradley to run the VA, and Bradley did the brilliant thing of connecting uh, the doctors of the best medical schools in the country with the VA. And so today, if you come to the United States, you'll find most of our VA medical centers uh, are right next to the very best medical schools in the country. So for example, if you're at Harvard Medical School, there's a Boston VA, and the doctors who teach in Harvard Medical School will also do their clinical work and their research work in the VA. And as a result of that, the VA is responsible for uh, a large number, if not most, of the innovations in American medicine, whether it's the shingles vaccine, prosthetics that move with sensors in your brain, uh, the, using a barcode to connect patients with medicine, the first electronic medical record, Tom Starzl, a VA doctor, did the first liver transplant, Michael DeBakey, who invented uh, artificial hearts, uh, was a VA doctor, so it goes on and on. So. The VA creates innovations for the country for American medicine. The VA trains 70% of the doctors in the country through their residencies. And the VA, of course, provides clinical care uh, to our veterans, which are about 19 million veterans in the country. Fantastic. And uh, in addition to your roles at Procter & Gamble and your roles in the military, and then your role at the VA, you're also currently the uh, chairman of the West Point Association of Graduates. And uh, would love to hear your thoughts on how graduates can give back to their institutions, um, because we just graduated our first class in history, and we now have alumni from American University of Kyiv. And what are your thoughts as we look to build what West Point has built over the last 160 years um, as the uh, chairman of our alumni association? Well, we've got about uh, 55,000 um, living graduates now, and. Uh, our intent is to be the most connected alumni body in the world. So we'd love to challenge you uh, with that, uh, to challenge the graduates of American University Kiev. Um, but we'd like to be the most connected alumni body in the world. And, and to do that, we create an organization called the Association of Graduates, as you said, 
where really we have we have two missions. One is to serve West Point, and we serve West Point by raising money and providing that money to create what we call a margin of excellence, where we really improve upon the money given by the government in order to create cadet experiences that make them better leaders of character when they graduate. The other thing we do is we serve the graduates themselves. So for example, if the graduate needs help filling out their uh, disability forms for the Department of Veterans Affairs, we have a veteran service officer, Sue Lyons, on staff who can help them do that. We, we raise money to help veterans who are in need. Um, we provide uh, tours of West Point. Uh, we do all kinds of things uh, to help serve graduates. And I'm proud to say that in the last U.S. News and World Report, U.S. News and World Report ranking, we were the fourth highest in the country of all universities in terms of participation rate and fundraising, 34%. Princeton leads, Williams is second. I think Connecticut is third and we're fourth. Wow, that's fantastic. I didn't know that. Yeah, the uh, the West Point Association of Graduates it has been so powerful and actually has been incredibly supportive of the American University of Kiev. Um, people like General Petraeus have been major donors uh, for our scholarship fund, um, Logistics Plus, a number of people. And then, of course, the West Point graduates that are on active duty that are supporting the mission within Ukraine, uh, uh, including my classmate, Lieutenant General Tony Agudo, who's the commander in Germany, supporting the entire effort in Ukraine, and they're doing a fantastic job. So um, what are your thoughts, lessons learned from, from what you've seen from the current situation in Ukraine after the illegal uh, full-scale invasion in 2022? What are the lessons learned in innovation that we should all watch out for? Well, I think... Um... You know, as as you and I talked uh, earlier, I I went to Kiev in 2019 uh, to work with the government at the time to help establish care for veterans. Um, and what I what I learned from the battlefield, uh, and what I brought back to West Point, and others have done this too, not just me, is it's a whole different battlefield than what you and I uh, trained for when we were at West Point. Um, I never thought about space as a battlefield. I never thought about drones. Uh, I never thought about cyber uh, as a battlefield. You know, in our day, we were worried about a three-dimensional battlefield. Now you've got virtually a five-dimensional battlefield. And, um, and so we're preparing for that. Uh, as you know, we're, we're building um, a new um, cyber engineering building at West Point. Uh, we're hiring more staff. We're training people. We're working on drones. We have drone bays in that building. We're working on robotics. We're working on lasers. Uh, for example, a laser that can shoot down a mortar round while it's in the air. Um, you know, so we're, we're really trying to learn from the battlefield, innovate, and then prepare our students for the future. Absolutely. And we're doing the same. Um, we are uh, you know, we're powered by Arizona State University, which is nine years running the most innovative university in the United States. And uh, we believe we can be the most innovative uh, university within Ukraine. Um, and the team is already proving to be very innovative at adapting both policies and procedures, but also uh, uh, new new learning techniques. So um, uh, but I know you had a, a presentation. Uh, would you uh, want to pull that up and uh, and go through it, all your life lessons, basically. It's very well organized, so I thought the team would really benefit from seeing the structure that you put together to explain these different lessons. Well, I won't go through every single slide, Dan, but, but let me start with uh, this, which is um, when I became Secretary of Veterans Affairs, there was a crisis. The previous secretary um, had resigned. There were supposedly, allegedly, 45 veterans waiting for care in Phoenix who weren't getting care. And this picture kind of typifies what where we were at. I was on Air Force One with President Obama, and I was going through my analysis of what was wrong and what we need to fix. And I want to briefly cover some of those topics, because I think for the students in particular, what I'm going to share is a model, a heuristic. And I think what you learn in education our models, our heuristics that you can then apply to every situation. In my case, this model is one I developed at the Procter & Gamble Company as I went from country to country. I lived and worked in the United States, in Canada, in the Philippines, in Japan, uh, in Brussels, Belgium. 
uh, and traveled all over the world, and I found this model very helpful. So let me quickly go through this. Um, you know, what one of the things that 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 caused the crisis at the VA is uh, soldiers were ten times more likely to survive the battlefield uh, than they were prior to the Gulf Wars. And as a result of that, we had a lot more disabled veterans and a lot more injured veterans. At the same time, our, our budget was exploding because uh, we had been fighting wars since 9-11 and obviously had a lot more veterans and a lot more disabled veterans. Uh, outpatient visits were skyrocketing and Congress had promised people who fought in the Middle East um, uh, free medical care from the VA for five years. Uh, veterans were moving to different locations. While most of our VA facilities were in high population areas like the Northeast, we found that when veterans were leaving the service, they were actually going to warm weather climates, not surprisingly, like the Southeast and the Southwest. So we had facilities in the wrong locations. Mm. And perhaps the biggest thing was uh, the aging of the veteran population. It was the aging of the Vietnam veteran population. Uh, if you look at this chart, you look at the purple bar. In 1975, there were 2 million veterans over the age of 65. And today, there are over 10 million veterans over the age of 65. That explosion of five times the number of veterans over the age of 65 puts a real stress on your health care. And that was something the, uh, the, VA, the VA hadn't, uh, hadn't uh, predicted and was a challenge for us. This is true. Bob, I'm not sure. Can, can the group see the chart? I can't see it. Uh, Oksana, I just want to make sure everybody can see it. It's not not being displayed on my screen. Well, it's on mine, and I hit share. Oksana, is that uh, being presented? Oh, you'll need to share it again, I guess. For some reason, it's not. Popular. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. There we go. There we go. You got it now? Yes. Okay, great. S still? We can see it, yes. Okay. Um, so I think what you should be looking at is the uh, is the chart that shows uh, two main veteran veterans over the age of 65 in uh, 1975, 10 million veterans over the age of 65 in um, in today. And then this is the model that I talked about. It starts with purpose, values, and principles, technical competence, four pillars, passionate leadership, sound strategies, robust systems, high-performance culture. If you start at the bottom, any high-performance organization always has to start with the purpose, values, and principles. So when I got to the VA, the question was, what's the purpose, what's the values, what's the principles? Some of that we didn't have. We actually didn't have a vision. So we created a vision to be the top customer service organization in the federal government. We uh, reinstated our values. We trained the organization on those values. Integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence, which as an acronym stands for um, I care. Uh, and, and, and we had people wear pins with those values. Um, the next the next part of the model is technical competence, you know, and we've already talked about the incredible medical competence of the VA, the innovations they developed. And basically, I wrote a, um, an editorial, an op-ed for the Baltimore Sun uh, toward the end of, um, of uh, my first year where I said, you know, not only is the VA critical for veterans, but it's critical for American medicine. Because if we, if we didn't do that innovation, nobody else in American medicine would do it. If you came to me as the, um, as the CEO of the Procter & Gamble company and, we, and you said, you know, I'd like you to invest in prosthetic devices that work by sensors in the brain, I'd say, well, how many people? There wouldn't be enough scale and a for-profit company wouldn't invest. The other thing we did was we used something called human-centered design to establish a journey map. And this is a uh, technology that's used by companies that are working on customer service. The idea is 
you you design a journey map of of the individual journey. In this case, from the day the person raises their hand and is sworn into the military till the day we bury them in a in a VA cemetery. And you you look at all those touch points. Where do they touch the organization? And then you get a grade for that touch point, a score. And then what you do over time, obviously, is you work to improve the score on all those touch points. And overall, that lifts the trust uh, of the organization. But this is something, for example, we're using now in the Association of Graduates at West Point to understand the touch points of the Association of Graduates versus its customer base. What are the scores we get and how do we improve those scores? And then there are four uh, pillars uh, uh, in a high performance organization. The first is, is culture. And culture may be the most important. I took this pyramid of a, um, normally the pyramid of most organizations is looks like a pyramid with the apex at the top. I turned it on its head and I said, no, our veterans and their families are at the top. And we as an organization need to rally around our veterans and our families. And the most important employees in our organization are those who are interfaced with those veterans and families every single day. And that was kind of a unique concept. Robust systems. We had a lot of system problems uh, and we had to fix, fix those systems. One of the systems we didn't have was a system that reapplied best practices across the organization. Sound strategies, we didn't have good strategies. So we had to go out and create strategies. And importantly, in a customer service organization, uh, while your first strategy is always about caring for your customer, which in our case was veterans, your second strategy has to be caring about employees because it's your employees who care for the customer. So strategy one was improving the veterans experience. Strategy two was improving the employee experience. And we spent a lot of money and a lot of time on training. Last but not least is passionate leadership. You know, do you have a leadership model that's pervasive in your organization? Uh, do you have training courses like Leaders Developing Leaders to help create better leadership? These are all the things that we did. And this is a, 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 a sample of the leadership model that we use. And you'll notice at the center is the stewardship of public trust and the commitment to public good. We also created a, uh, a Road to Veterans Day, a 90-day plan, because uh, at the time I took over, trust was broken. We had to rebuild trust. That became the first strategy. And the way we rebuilt trust is uh, I had to get out and I had to do town hall meetings of, of veterans, of employees, and let them know that we were going to turn this thing around and that I had a good heart and I was working on behalf of veterans, that I was a veteran. Uh, this is a picture of uh, President Obama, Vice President Biden at the time, and myself uh, after my uh, after Vice President after President Obama nominated me uh, at the VA. Well, the good news from all this work is trust was up. We started at forty-seven percent when I left office. It was above sixty percent. Today, it's above eighty percent. It's approaching ninety percent. Uh, more veterans are getting in for care. We cut veteran homelessness by half. We've made it easy for veterans uh, to access the VA. We've also made it a better place to work. Um, claims are up, call center answering time is down. Uh, it's just a better place to work. And uh, as a result, uh, veterans are happy and the VA is transforming. Let me stop there and I'd be happy to, Dan, to take any questions you may have or anyone else may have. Sure, that's great. Thanks, Bob. And uh, yeah, there's, so much material here to combine when you talk about your Procter & Gamble days, running the largest consumer products company in the world, to uh, to running the VA, to now the West Point Association of Graduates, and then, of course, the actual situation on the ground in, in Ukraine. Um, to go back to the uh, the Procter & Gamble days, like, so you, know, you, you rose from uh, entry-level role after fresh leaving the military to, to, to lead the whole organization globally. How do you... How do you run an enterprise that large and 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 feel like you can reach every employee? Like a, it's just, I mean, what was the headcount in? Yeah, we had a headcount of about one hundred twenty thousand employees, spread over about two hundred countries, 
And um, the thing I always think about in terms of your question are hard points and soft points. So in other words, what are the hard points, which in some ways are non-negotiable? And then what are the soft points where you want people to use their own initiative, their own creativity, their own innovation to get things done? So for example, uh, strategies. The strategies are hard points, but the soft points are how people execute those strategies. So you might have a strategy of having superior products. We want products that perform better than our competitive products. As a result, you invest in R&D, uh, you invest in superior uh, raw materials, you invest in superior manufacturing, uh, but then how you market those products in each country may be a little bit different because the marketing of a product uh, requires difference. One, one example, and it's, it's an example I like because it's pretty obvious. Um, for those of you familiar with uh, Pantene shampoo, uh, Pantene hair uh, hair products. Uh, I had something to do with the creation of those back in about 1991 in Asia. An Asian hair is twice the radius of a Caucasian hair. Uh, and if you remember your geometry, twice the radius means uh, six times the surface area because it's two times pi. Pi is 3.1416. So six times the surface area. So uh, a Caucasian hair may be like this, and an Asian hair may be like this. So as a result, an Asian hair requires a lot more conditioning than a Caucasian hair. So if you're Japanese and you buy Pantene, you expect to have a lot more conditioning in that bottle than if you're a Caucasian in the United States buying Pantene, uh, it would have a lot less conditioning. And so the whole approach to marketing that product and the designing that product in those two countries would be markedly different based on the physiology of the consumer. Hmm. That's fascinating. Um, didn't know that about uh, about hair. So uh, I don't have much hair. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, as we look to uh, Ukraine situation currently, you know, we have nearly a million uh, soldiers uh, under arms. You know, they're going to be coming back hopefully after victory soon. Um, to returning to the society. What are your lessons learned about how society can better integrate veterans fresh from the battlefield? Well, number one, uh, I think, is is you've got to show care. Um, we have an example in the United States after the Vietnam War. Um, you and I were both in the military then, where, where the military wasn't respected, um, and, uh, and veterans coming back from the Vietnam War weren't treated properly. Um, we, you can't allow that to happen. Uh, you've got to embrace uh, your military uh, with open arms because in the United States since 1973, we've had an all-volunteer army. And if you expect uh, young people to volunteer for service, you've got to care for those young people. Um, now, how, what does care look like? Well, care looks like uh, helping them get a job. And we have many employers in the United States who line up uh, to give jobs. For example, Disney has a, uh, a veteran officer who's responsible for bringing veterans into Disney. At Procter & Gamble, we have the same thing. Stephanie Markich brings veterans into Procter & Gamble. Uh, secondly, healthcare. Uh, no question that through military service, um, you have health challenges when you leave military service. Uh, and they're unique health challenges. That's why we have a Department of Veterans Affairs, because at the, the VA, we can treat things like traumatic brain injury, TBI, and a civilian doctor may not know much about that. So uh, health care becomes very important. Benefits. Uh, one of the biggest benefits in this country is education. If you serve in the military, we have something called a GI Bill that you can use yourself or you can give to your children or family members to use. Um, housing, we have uh, no, uh, no down payment required mortgages for housing in the United States. We have adaptive housing for veterans who, who have become disabled because of their service. So um, I could go on and on, but care is really, really important. And it's the care of, um, of thanking people for their service in Ukraine. It's the care of 
putting your hand on your heart to recognize those veterans who have come back from service? You know, when I'm in Ukraine, and I was in Ukraine just a couple of days ago, um, I get many, many questions, Bob, about uh, the current situation in the United States politically, specifically related to support for Ukraine. Um, and I know you follow this closely. What, what are your thoughts on uh, uh, the average Americans support or not or not or lack thereof of uh, Ukraine? And then also any thoughts on the supplemental and how things will or will not get through Congress? Well, the vast majority of Americans, uh, the vast majority, I think it's over 70 percent support uh, supporting Ukraine. Um, those who have studied history and look at, uh, for example, World War II and what um, Hitler did in, in Germany and Neville Chamberlain's um, uh, Peace in Our Time, which was uh, obviously uh, wrong, um, you know, realize that if you don't stop uh, a, an aggressive dictator uh, in the beginning, it becomes much more costly uh, to stop them in the end. So I think most Americans realize that we've got to support Ukraine because they're not just fighting for themselves, they're fighting for all of us who believe in democracy. Um, and that's, of course, obviously the lesson I took away when I visited Kiev. Um, so I think that's the that's the um, the lesson. Now the problem is you've got a House of Representatives with a leader uh, who is uh, worried about losing his power uh, from the small right wing contingent that is isolationist. And I think what you're going to find is that uh, other members of the House are finding ways to get the bill for Ukraine on the floor of. Uh, the House, uh, even if uh, Mike Johnson, the Speaker, uh, is an impediment. Um, it's going to take time. Uh, it's going to take some machinations to do it. But um, I'm quite confident it will happen because the American people want it. I agree. I agree. It can't happen soon enough. That's the, the challenge is the sure. day is, a, is a delay. But yeah, I, I, I echo your sentiments. And uh, uh, so there's a question from uh, from one of our faculty members, Mark Forger. So uh, uh, what are your thoughts about does Ukraine need a U.S. style GI Bill and what role can the American University Keith play? Uh, and would do you think the U.S. would be uh, willing or actively involved at all in such a program? Well, I'm I'm a huge believer in in uh, the success of the Marshall Fund, for example, after World War Two. I mean, who would have thought? in 1941-42, that in 2024, Germany, a united Germany, and uh, Japan would be two of our biggest and staunchest allies and democracies. Um, that wouldn't have happened without uh, President Truman and Secretary Marshall uh, coming up with the Marshall Plan, which rebuilt these two countries and rebuilt them at a time where it wasn't clear whether they were going to become communist or they were gonna become democratic. Uh, that wasn't clear at the time. I mean, I know in retrospect, it seems perfectly clear. Um, so I, that's, that's point one. Point two, if you look at the United States, uh, after World War II, the GI Bill transformed the country. Uh, you had families with uh, service members coming back from the war. My dad is an example who was the first member of his family who ever went to college. Well, he couldn't have afforded to do that. He did that because of the GI Bill. And, and so I'm a huge believer in the GI Bill and how education can transform a society. And so I don't know, I, I, I apologize, I don't know the numbers in Ukraine, but um, I think uh, putting out a GI Bill and, and being able to, um, to transform a society by improving education is a huge, huge uh, idea. And, and, and I think it goes hand in hand with strengthening democracy, because I think education and democracy um, intersect. I don't think they run parallel. Excellent. I agree. And they are starting a new voucher system um, for students that they will be able to have the mechanics to pay um, to support uh, uh, young students going to college. The higher the, the grade scores, the higher the, uh, the coupon um, that they can apply to AUK or another school. 
Um, you know, we, we've seen that in the U.S. be very successful as well. Georgia has uh, the HOPE scholarship. If you get a B, I think it's a B average or a B plus average in high school, you can go to any Georgia school and the state will pay for it uh, using their um, proceeds from their gambling tax. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not too keen on the tax, I mean, on, the, on the gambling, but, um, but you know, they've transformed a whole generation of students. That's amazing. Yeah, Texas does a wonderful job too. Um, what other lessons uh, do you think that America has learned sometimes the hard way um, that can apply to, uh, to reintegrating? Um, and right now, for instance, I believe Ukraine has, we, we had a high unemployment rate in our veterans in the early 2000s when the wars first started kicking off. And right now, I believe Ukraine has a 24% unemployment rate amongst veterans right now. So what what, what specifically can uh, can companies do? Um, you mentioned that having a primary point of contact is one. Um, what other things can they do to inspire people to, to get jobs? Well, one of the things we did uh, as a Department of Veterans Affairs in conjunction with Department of Defense is we ran a lot of recruiting fairs. Um, I attended many of them. I can remember one I attended uh, in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, where we had the uh, Navy, Marine Corps, Army from Schofield Barracks all at the same event. We had Microsoft, Disney, P&G, um, all trying to hire people. Um, I think that was, I think those are critically important events. And what we had to do, and maybe this is unique to the United States military, we had to get our non-commissioned officers to support their soldiers and airmen and sailors going to these events because it wasn't obvious. Um, secondly, uh, I think another, another uh, approach is to work with your trade unions. Uh, I, I was part of a program in Chicago where um, we would guarantee to any service member coming out of the service a job with the gas industry uh, if they would come uh, out of the service, join the gas industry, join the union of the gas industry, and we would send them to free community college to learn that vocational skill. So what I'm arguing here is you have to think about the vocational skills that need trained, and in the United States, that tends to be in community colleges, although there are many universities like UCLA looking at creating vocational arms of their university. You have to look at university education for those who want that. But then you also have to look at the employment afterwards and, and try to guarantee that employment afterwards. I used to joke with people that I love this program with the gas industry in Chicago, because who do I want working on the gas system in my house? but somebody who's run a nuclear power plant on an aircraft carrier, right? Because they're not going to make any mistakes. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. And, um, you know, with your background, both in government and then within the private sector for Procter & Gamble, one of the big questions right now is, you know, when is the money going to start flowing into Ukraine um, to rebuild, to expand, to grow? Um what concerns would you have as a CEO looking at uh, investing in Ukraine? And what do you think the sequencing will be for different companies uh, entering the markets? Because right now there's a lot of companies talking, but not a lot of companies actually investing. Well, of course, the uh, for the Procter & Gamble company, we're usually a relatively early investor because we're in consumer goods products. So um, on any given day, 5 billion people on the planet use at least one Procter & Gamble product. So I have, I have been to Kiev, uh, as in my role as CEO of the Procter & Gamble company. Uh, we had a, a, a wonderful event uh, with the ambassador and others. Um, investing is, is um, you know, you obviously want to invest when you believe it's safe to invest. And when you believe that you can, um, you know, reward your shareholders with uh, returns uh, from the products that you sell. I know that we've had operations in in um, in Ukraine and and if we pulled out because of the war because I'm not familiar with what exactly we did. I know we pulled out of Russia, uh, but that was for obviously for political reasons as well. Um, you know we we would be one of the first back in as soon as uh, it was safe enough for our employees and safe enough for the investment from our shareholders.
I love doing business in Ukraine. I have to tell you. Beautiful country. I love going. Yeah. There. Beautiful. Um, let's see, I got another question over here from uh, uh, So uh, uh, this is a, a great question um, uh, from uh, from one of our legal team members. Um, but uh, uh, he heard from an employer recently within Ukraine that wanted to hire veterans, but they were concerned about any mental state or any PTSD that they might be experiencing. Um, what are your thoughts on how to address that as a nation when you have a million people under arms in intense combat? Yeah, that's a great question, Robert. And I I, um, I want to answer it in two different ways. So, for example, at the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, for those veterans who wanted to employ their GI Bill to go back to university, either get their undergraduate degree or graduate degree, we would provide a psychologist or psychiatrist or counselor at the universities with a critical mass of veterans to provide that care for traumatic brain injury, for post-traumatic stress. In a company, we do the same thing. Um, in a company, we, we have um, employee programs where people can take advantage of mental health care and other things. I think the point is you've got to, you've got to provide that care. You've got to have that care available uh, for those who need it. Um, just like just like we have blind employees and we provide special accommodation for blind employees, or we have employees um, who may have vertigo and we provide special accommodation for that. I think, I think we should just look at the, the uh, needs uh, for adaptation that military service bring as that person bringing their diversity to the office and that diversity resulting in a richer employment uh, a group of employees uh, and better innovation. It's my experience uh, that I always try to put diverse groups of people together because if everybody brings their diversity to a problem, undoubtedly we're going to get a more innovative solution. Absolutely. Um, another question from Oksana is um, uh, basically the adaptation of veterans returning you know, it, it should veterans go through some kind of training to help uh, uh, not deprogram them, but uh, but basically to help the, improve their communication skills to be able to discuss the things they've been through? Um, and should the companies have to go through some type of training too to be able to understand and communicate to the entire population, hey, why it's important to hire veterans, what the benefits are, which which side or both should we focus? Yeah, as you would imagine, the answer is and or. I mean, you know, it's it's let's do both. Um, we we as a Department of Veterans Affairs, in conjunction with the Department of Defense, try to do that um, that whatever you want to call it, reprogramming, adaptation. It's clear that the skills that you learn on the battlefield, hypersensitivity, uh, quick decision making. Um, uh, and more are not the skills that lead to healthy relationships, right? Hypersensitivity, decision, you know, um, they just aren't. So you do need to do some work to help the individual recognize that and get back to the kind of skills that their marriage and their company mates uh, will appreciate. Uh, the proctor, I, I think the, the, the onus is on the Department of Defense and, and, and the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs to do that. But then I also think it's important, uh, particularly in an environment like Ukraine, where the, 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 the battlefield is obvious and, and, um, and everybody should be playing a role for all companies to do that training of their individuals. You know, here's how we can help our veterans adapt to this environment. And here's why they will be valuable employees and valuable teammates for you. Um, because obviously we want them to be embraced, not, not ostracized for their service. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. A couple of years ago, we did a, uh, for their leadership, we did a, uh, uh, we worked with the Association for Talent Development. We created a brochure where we had about 20 different companies uh, put together what they were doing for veterans. And most of the companies 
had no idea like what was happening at the grassroots level because so many people were doing little projects here in different cities. And when they aggregated it, they realized they were doing so much more for veterans, but they also then could leverage and scale those when they saw the success. Exactly. So yeah, connect them. Yeah. Those current best approaches pervasive throughout the, the organization. Yeah, I think we'll maybe we'll uh, host the conference for uh, veterans. We'd love to have you join either in person or, uh, or 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 by Zoom. But maybe we'll we'll host the first conference with uh, with corporations, bringing our, our our investors or some of the largest companies in Ukraine, D Tech and Rain and E Palm, and we'd love to bring them in. Uh, and if you'd be interested, we'd love to have you as a keynote speaker at something like that. I think we need sure. to mobilize the the corporations. Absolutely. You know, I, we, we, we can't forget about the power of the, of the, um, of the private sector. You know, when I was in the Philippines, uh, 1991, President Clinton came to visit and he said, you know, business is my foreign policy. And um, there's a lot to be said for that. When I was uh, uh, working at the Procter & Gamble Company, and we were building factories in China, we were raising living standards. We were raising living standards. We were raising work environment standards. Um, and we took a half a billion people out of poverty in China. I mean, business does have a role to play, a very important role to play, and it's important business realizes that. Absolutely. Uh, Maria asks a, a great question, and unfortunately it's a, it's a tragic question, but uh, uh, Bob, I've uh, read that unfortunately the level of suicide is still high in the U.S. amongst veterans. At what stage uh, the signs of potential suicide should and can be indicated and by whom? Yeah, I think there's, uh, it's a great question, uh, Maria, and there's, there's a lot of work going on in this. In fact, I'm involved in it. I'm the chairman of the board of the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, and we have a big project going on right now to have veteran suicide. It's been a stubborn number, and uh, and there's a lot of a lot of work to do. Um, let me talk a little bit uh, about some of that work. Um, number one, it's everybody's responsibility. You know, all of us need to be watching. And basically, what we say is, if you see it, report it. Do something about it. Don't just uh, walk away. And also. Don't be numb to what you see. If you know, if you see something, do something about it. Secondly, uh, get a trained professional involved. There in the U.S., we have a veterans crisis line, um, and I've I've referred many many uh, calls to that crisis line, and and the people there have saved their lives. In fact, there's a HBO documentary on the VA crisis line um, employees, and they just do amazing amazing work. Uh, number three, we have to get after some of the problems that we've got that that are that are getting in the way of us getting this done. Uh, for example, um, in the United States, uh, mental health professionals are licensed by state. That means that we can't use telehealth. We can't have a doctor in one state treat a patient in another state because they may not be uh, licensed in that state. So we've got to obliterate this patchwork of licenses and move to one federal uh, a license so we can use telehealth because telehealth enables uh, uh, mental health care. That's just one example, but there are a plethora of those examples. Uh, gun laws, uh, guns are too prevalent in the United States. Guns need to be locked up. 70% um, of suicides, over 70% of suicides are done by gun. Um, it's just much easier to pull the trigger than it is to stab yourself. Um, so making guns less accessible uh, is another aspect. Uh, and that flies in the face of some of the political issues that we have state by state on the prevalence of guns. But those are just uh, some examples. I go a lot further. We, we don't train enough uh, mental health professionals in this country. Uh, we're getting better. We put scholarships in what's called the Clay Hunt Act, which was a, an act that was done on behalf and named for a veteran who, um, a Marine sniper who took their own life. Um, you know, scholarships are important to get people into mental health. Uh, another thing is our insurance reimbursements aren't, aren't uh, enough to cover the cost of mental health care. So we've got a lot of things that we're working on, but these are all barriers to, to get this problem. I always say, I always say, and, and if you're watching this, you might want to remember this, 
Organizations are perfectly designed to get the results they get. So if you don't like the results of your organization, you've got to change it. If you don't like the, the suicide results, there's something going on that's creating that. You've got to change it. Absolutely. Well, that brings up uh, really from a lesson learned perspective, uh, one of the questions here I think is great. Like um, for all of your experience leading extremely large organizations, some of the largest in the world, um, what lessons would you take back and what new initiatives, if you were to be assigned today as the secretary of the VA for a second time, what programs would you implement now, given your hindsight and your experience? Well, we've made some we've made some advances in uh, some of the legislation. So uh, the secretary has got more to do today. But I have to say the the number one thing that sticks in my craw and certainly stuck in the craw of President Obama was veteran homelessness. Um, you know, it's just inexcusable to think that somebody can serve their country uh, and come back from that service and then be homeless. Um, now, you, you should know that veteran homelessness, it's not like you have a bunch of veterans who want to live on the street, but they might have some other uh, root cause, whether it's drug addiction, um, mental health uh, that requires care. And so uh, my, my intention would be to get a caseworker involved with every single veteran and uh, get those veterans into shelter and get them off the street. When President Obama was president, we were able to reduce veteran homelessness by 50%, uh, but it, it's gone back up uh, since then. And I think, I think there's more work to be done. Um, that's, that's one example. Um, more examples, uh, we have... We have veterans who have benefit of the GI Bill, but don't know it and don't use it. So I would get more veterans into education. Education may be the number one way in the world to transform your life. And so why not have people taking advantage of that? Um, three, the problem with getting veterans employed isn't getting them employed in this country. In fact, veteran unemployment in this country is really quite low. The problem is getting them to stay with the job because oftentimes they choose the wrong job to begin with. So we've got some work to do there. Um, but but overall, uh, Secretary uh, McDonough, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs is doing a great job. Fantastic. You know, what are your thoughts on uh, when we originally started the GI Bill after World War II, the United States allowed that money to not only be used for education, but for small businesses? What do you think the lessons learned for Ukraine could be? Because not everybody might be meant for college, but uh, what other options do you think we learned or didn't learn? I love that idea. In fact, I was um, I was proposing that to Congress when I was secretary. Let's find a way if somebody wants to use their GI Bill money uh, to be an entrepreneur and start a new venture. Let's help them do that. Certainly in this country, we have small business administration loans. Um, and that's the number one way. We also have uh, priorities around veteran-owned businesses. We have priorities around disabled veteran-owned businesses. Uh, those are all good things. But I think anything we can do to enable um, entrepreneurs uh, is a really good thing. And we see a lot of businesses um, growing right now uh, that are owned by veterans. Interestingly, people like to invest in them. They find that the return on investment for a veteran owned business is greater because the accountability those veterans feel for their business is greater. It's the same accountability that they may have had on the battlefield. Fantastic. Um, here's a question from uh, Ludmila. Um, thank you for the interesting presentation, Bob. Uh, how do we avoid veterans being used as a tool in politicians' hands? <laughs> or, or should veterans be active in politics or both? <laughs> Well, veterans, uh, at least in the U.S., we ran a, uh, there was a group called Got Your Six that ran a survey um, of veterans who have returned from war. And we found that veterans are more active in their community. They're, they're on the school boards, they're, um, they run for office, um, and that's good news. So you want veterans in your community, at least in the United States, because they are more active in politics, uh, in in making their community a better place. Uh, how do we stop veterans being used, used as 
as a tool in politics. Um, the veterans have to stop that. I mean, um, Mark Milley wrote, uh, our former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff wrote quite a uh, interesting and provocative letter to the um, to the um, uh, military services when he found himself um, inadvertently caught in a political situation. And basically, we we've got to keep uh, the U.S. military out of politics. We've got to we've got to be apolitical. Uh, our Constitution says that the military is commanded by the President of the United States, a civilian, and uh, we've got to be apolitical and we've got to preserve that um, lack of bias, um, lack of political bias. I agree. And, uh, you know, what I've learned over the years is, um, you know, in the United States, we take an oath of office to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Um, we don't take an oath to a person. So we we start with our alignment um, aligned with the Constitution, which is uh, which is the foundation for America. Um, we don't uh, take an oath to a party or a person, uh, and and that right away sets the tone. Um, and you know, when we're in uniform in the United States, you're not allowed to politic. You're not allowed to go to a protest in uniform. You're, you're allowed to go as a civilian, but you can't go speak on air in your uniform and give a political position. So we try to take the soldier out of politics and saying as an officer on duty knows no one, you know, you're supposed to obey the Constitution. Absolutely. So, Bob, this has been uh, wonderful. It's it's an honor to have you and uh, with your incredible experience to be able to come speak with our students and um, and for them to be able to hear the wisdom of your 40 years, uh, 50 years of, uh, of continued service, a lifetime of service to the nation. Um, thanks for all you do for West Point, for the Army and for the United States. And I uh, really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, Dan. It's been my pleasure to be with you all. Anything I can do to help, I'm here. Thank you, sir. And I got to say, go Army, beat Navy. Go, go Army, beat Navy. Thank you, Dan. Take care. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.